So thank you for joining so, today. Uh, and so today we we will discuss on the topic of karma and compassion. Broadly speaking, does the philosophy of karma make us hard-hearted? And I'll just give a brief introduction to this, and then we can have some question answers. Thank you for joining today, everyone. And uh, <clears throat> most of you may know that you know I have a I have a physical handicap. I have polio in one of my legs, so it's I need some crutches or some braces for walking. So when I was a child, I always used to wonder that. Um, why was this problem there with me and i had grown up so there's a difference between growing up in a, a religious family and growing up with philosophical understanding so we in in a general religious upbringing we understand that god's will is supreme and whatever happens is by his will but that is that can be give some devotional satis devotional pacification that maybe god will bring some good out of the bad but still that doesn't really explain why something happens so it is only when i started studying the bhagavad gita and then i understood the principle of karma and and i had later on i read this idea that that the philosophy of karma can actually make one hard hearted in fact there is a there was an article in btg a few years ago about how karma kicks a football coach the idea was that there is football coach from a, for a major league in uk and he said that people who who are poor or people who are handicapped in some way it's because of their karma and there was like a hailstorm of censure upon him where they said that people said that how can you be so insensitive how can you be so people are already suffering and on top of them you are demonizing them and eventually he had to resign or he was fired so the idea is that when somebody is going through some distress is the philosophy of karma meant to put them on a further guilt uh, burden them with a further sense of guilt uh, that is the idea that some people have but at least in my experience it wasn't like that it was generally the way the philosophy of karma has been understood in the tradition it is primarily forward looking not backward looking it is primarily more for preparing us to make wiser choices in the future not so much to get into a post mortem about what choices who has done in the past and philosophy or any any particular philosophical point in gen, uh, in specific if it is not understood in the context in which it is uh, applied traditionally then we can apply it in a different tradition different context and that can be counterproductive so this is the whole idea of karma is to help us choose better so so i'll just make one point and then we can have move on to question answers the word karma itself has multiple meanings you can have four or five meanings of the word karma so before we, before we launch into discussion question answer let's look at these meanings so that we know what we are talking about so the word karma can refer at one level to the law of karma nobody can escape their own their karma uh, so or the law of karma is infallible uh, it's inescapable human law can be escaped but the law of karma can't be escaped here karma refers to the ca causal the link bit the link between cause and effect between action and consequence that's one meaning of the word karma the other meaning of the word karma is often say if i say i am suffering my own karma there what we mean is we are talking about the reactions of our karma so reactions of our actions rather so we have done some actions and why is somebody going through this it's because of their own karma that means the past actions that they have done they are getting the reactions so karma can be used to refer to reactions karma can refer be used to refer even to actions choose your karma well right now that means how are you going to act right now choose that responsibly so karma can refer to the system of action reaction it can refer to reaction 
it can refer to action beyond that karma can also refer to duty karmanne vaadhikaraste ma phaleshu kadachana in the bhagavad gita krishna says that do your you have a right to doing your duty but don't be attached to the results so karma in that sense refers to the the principle of action or specifically of responsible action or duty and karma can also refer to one particular kind of action where we say that there is karma vikarma and akarma karma is pious action akarma is uh, vikarma is impious action and akarma is action that is counter uh, that is not going to produce any reaction so basically when we look at uh, so with this meaning of the word karma broadly speaking then the bhagavad gita talks about karma its stress is on understanding how we can choose wisely the gita doesn't go so much into the analysis of say now this war is happening why is this war happening is it a reaction to particular karma if somebody is going to suffer something is it going to be because of this karma or that karma it isn't going to specifics it focuses on principles and in the bhagavad gita again as i said earlier it is a forward looking book it doesn't go so much back into saying you know who he did this and she did this and all that it's just that how can you act responsibly how can you act in a way by which you can create a brighter future for yourself so that is the principle of karma so any questions or comments or we can just start our qa session now Hey Krishna, yes, I have a question, Prabhu. Yes, um, please. I'd like mm-hmm. to know um, how our karma and free will interact with one another, and you know, can we use our free will to mitigate our karma? Okay, how do our karma and our free will in- interact with each other? So here, karma we are using more in the sense of the reactions to our past actions, isn't it? yeah so then how does that affect us so yes we could say that karma in the sense of our past karmas past actions reactions they create our situations and karma determines our situations so we determine our decisions so in that sense it's like a weather forecast so weather forecast uh, if we know okay it's going to be stormy it's going to be it's going to be rainy it's going to be Uh, snowy then that is something we can't control knowing that helps us to some extent okay i have to drive carefully or maybe i don't want to drive today so that's one level of understanding that karma determines our decision karma determines our situations our free will determines our decisions so for example somebody is born in maybe a wealthy family somebody is born in a poor family so those differences somebody is is by that by their karma but somebody can be born in a poor family but then they grow up responsible they were, were live responsibly and they they become successful in life on the other hand somebody is born in a wealthy family but they become entitled they get all up entitlement mentality and they squander all their wealth they live the life of a wastrel so the free will is always there with each one of us and karma determines the situations now we could make this a little more subtle if we want and we also can also say that the situation for the soul is not just the physical situation the situation is also the psychological situation we all have a particular kind of body and a particular kind of mind that we get by our past karma so now the mind does not determine our actions although the mind prompts us in particular directions so for example krishna tells arjuna that by your karma that means by your past you have got the body and mind of a kshatriya of a warrior now while you got the body and mind of a warrior if you try to act like a minister like a like a brahmin like a sage you will not be able to sustain that so our our dispositions they so you could say our situations refer to physical and our dispositions refer to our mental uh, mental inclination or mental situation basically so both of these are determined by our past karma but neither our situations nor our dispositions entirely determine our decisions they affect our decisions but they don't determine so we always have some free will so the standard example that is given in the bhagavad gita itself is that it's like a the if you consider sky to be like upside down bowl 
ball then the wind moves inside the sky so it can't move outside the area of the sky but within that area it can always move so we have we always have free will but by our past karma the area over which we can exercise the free will may be curtailed in some way or maybe determined in some way so if somebody is born with a iq of 170 now they can do so many things with that iq uh, but somebody is born with iq of 110 they can't do that many things but still everybody has free will so the free will is we always have uh, we could say unlimited freedom within a limited framework like a horse tied to a pole within the circumference of the rope of the pole the horse can move unlimitedly left right up down sit so anything you can do so there is unlimited free freedom but within a limited framework so the limited framework is determined by our past karma okay thank you thank you thank you thank you definitely hare krishna hare krishna thanavat friends hello um i had a question um similar yes, by uh In relation to your answer that you just gave, you had mentioned that Arjuna was given a body of a Shatriya given his past karma, and um, I had heard that, for example, that Shatriyas in general live in the most of, mode of passion. So, is there a relationship between karma and the three gunas? Uh, for example, good karma results in um, the Sattva gun, or mix good half half good karma and bad karma. results in rajaguna could you uh, explain um, if there's a relationship okay. that's a good question does karma determine our gunas also yes definitely traditionally it was understood that there are four social divisions brahmana kshatriya vaishya shudras and if one lives dutifully as a Shat- as a shudra in one life the next life they will be born as a vaishya in the next life they will further born as a kshatriya in the next life they will be born as a brahmana and when you we live dutifully what does it mean that each each particular social division each varna has its own set of duties and when one follows those duties lives within the regulation then one experiences some limited elevation so yes by our past now each of these uh, varnas are also associated with certain modes so the, the brahmana varna is usually associated with the mode of goodness so broadly speaking our modes are shaped by our past the modes that we get are shaped by our past but these are not fixed somebody might be born in a relatively pious or virtuous family but if they get into bad association um then what happens once they they are born into the uh, if they get into bad association they might get into the modes of passion and ignorance also okay Thank you. Very Thank good. you. So, Hare Krishna Prabhu, I have another question. Um, yes, please. So, understanding that um, all of our life circumstances are basically governed by our karma, how can we stay um, compassionate toward others? You know, as you mentioned, you know. when you read about karma and you start to take it on it you become hard hearted so how yeah. can we do to be more compassionate rather than you know like you said, the example that you gave with the coach okay it's a very important question there is a difference between being hard hearted and being clear headed or level headed so several of my friends are doctors and they tell me that quite often for a doctor to perform his his or her duty uh, emotion can come in the way a doctor's work is actually work filled with kindness compassion but if there is too much emotion emotion comes in the way of judgment so to take a sim- simple example here say somebody is alcoholic and they have suffered repeatedly because of the alcoholism and then they have been told by the doctor don't drink again otherwise it could be f- fatal for you and yet that person drinks again and they are rushed into the er emergency ro- uh, room and then the doctor is there now the doctor will understandably be annoyed even angry 
But at that time, the doctor is not meant to, you fool. I told you don't drink. Why did you drink? You suffer and you die now. That can never be the mood of a doctor. The doctor has to first treat. So when a patient is there, the first thing that a doctor has to consider is what is my duty over here? So that's why along with the philosophy of karma, there is also always the concept of dharma. Dharma is our duty. So it is also karma in one of the senses of the word. But so whenever we are interacting with others, our focus has to be not on what is their karma, but on what is our dharma. So a doctor has to think, what is my duty when a patient is sick? Yes, the first is treat the patient, get them out of that emergency, get them out of the pain. And then of course, the doctor may also have to give a cautionary note or cautionary warning that you cannot keep doing this again and again. But that, has, that shouldn't be the sole mode of interaction between the doctor and the patient. Simply warning or chastising. So when somebody is in a in, in a phase of distress, our primary focus should be, what is my dharma in this situation? What am I meant to do in this situation? And that if we focus on, then naturally, if we see somebody who is in distress, we have to see maybe, maybe it's my duty to help if somebody is in distress. You know, charity or compassion are considered important virtues, not just virtues, but also duties in the, in the broad dharmic traditions. And when we are interacting with people at a one-to-one -one level, it is not for us to judge people based on their past, past karma in terms of past life's karma. If we start judging people based on their past life's karma, we will become completely heartless. Now, if they say a person is robbed and that person goes to the police or to the king and the king says, oh, you are robbed because of your past karma, then social order will break down. Or if say a baby is crying and a mother thinks, oh, this baby is crying because of her past karma, then that will dry up all maternal love. So we don't do that. So the mother and the king have to see what is their dharma. And so we understand at a philosophical level that everybody is going through the consequences of their actions. But the primary focus is not to be into that hyper analytical mode, what, what consequences this person going through. Our focus should be on what the responsible attitude, what, what am I meant to do in this situation? So what is my duty in this situation? And sometimes it may be that there is very little that we can do in that situation. And then we can just offer our good wishes and prayers and move on. Or sometimes we do what is required and whatever is possible for us. So that's why the principle of karma will make us level-headed. That means we don't get sentimentally carried away and just uh, try to fix anything and everything because there are so many things wrong in the world. It's not our duty or responsibility to try to fix everything. But that doesn't mean we become completely apathetic. So the philosophy of karma can make us level-headed so that we can act in a way that is compassionate but also effective. Otherwise, we just try to go, try to fix every problem and we end up fixing nothing. Does that make sense? Thank you. Absolutely. Beautiful answer. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Prabhuji, yes. you mentioned about duty, um, right? So mm -hmm. a, sort of a related question. So uh, scriptures talk about something called prayas chitta or something like atonement. So yes. uh, how does that work? Like, uh, let's say I realize that I have done something wrong. So is mm -hmm. it possible to counteract the reaction for that uh, action uh, by doing something good? Uh, like, are they do they cancel each other out? Okay, so with respect to this... We have to understand that philosophy is often conveyed through metaphors, but metaphors are not enough to completely describe philosophical truths. So sometimes we may say that this is like a karmic bank account, that, that metaphor might be used. So if I have incurred a debt, so if I have negative balance, that means I have to pay something. So if we have done some misdeed, that means we have got a negative balance over there and that has to be corrected. So how do I correct that? I pay, pay back. So, so this, this metaphor has limited utility. It, it has some utility, but what happens is that atonement essentially is a means by which we show 
through actions our regret for what we have done so now even from a normal legal perspective suppose say now now riots have broken out in many parts of america and <clears throat> now when this has happened say some some wrong doers are caught and then suppose they are fined now does the finding uh, actually repair the wrong that has been done uh, if a house has been burned down it has been burned down okay you could say if a business has been burned down or broken down okay you can repair it but still it has been burned down for some time there is so much time and then loss that is the, the time and energy and money that is lost so even if they compensate the compensation does not really literally lead to it doesn't take things back to the way they were entirely and especially if there is uh, some irreparable injury or if there is loss of life then it can't so even if somebody if say person a kills person b intentionally or unintentionally and then the person a goes for 25 years or even life imprisonment does that really negate this or even if you say there is a capital punishment and a is killed does that really it doesn't bring b back to life so in that sense there is when there is atonement atonement is basically a voluntary acceptance of one's wrong doing and a voluntary willingness uh, to to accept the cons to undergo the consequences of that so it's like somebody has committed a wrong and rather than waiting for the police to come and apprehend them they themselves go and surrender to the police so atonement is in that sense like that now what exactly does atonement do at one level it is said that <clears throat> it is very much recommended if somebody has done something wrong they should atone for it and there are various practices given in the traditions in the that in the vedic tradition there are you do this activity you should this should be the atonement in <clears throat> in christianity in islam there are various ideas of atonement like that now how exactly atonement will counter that is a little subtle i said in a literal sense a wrong that has been done it cannot really be restored so things that have been burned down you cannot unburn them but you can rebuild them to some extent not everything can be rebuilt also so that the when the so in the vedic scriptures it is said very clearly that if you have done this action wrong you can do this to do atonement the bhagavatam speaks things more from a transcendental perspective and there it says that now atonement is more of an action whereas remorse or regret is more of a disposition is more of a emotion in the heart so there are two sanskrit words is prayaschit and paschataap so prayaschit is more the action that we may do whereas paschataap is more of the emotion that we feel so that's a remorse or regret so the, what the bhagavatam says is that for reformation to happen for change to happen just the atonement is not enough the atonement may free one from the karmic reaction now karmic reaction comes in two different ways one is that if we do something wrong then we get a consequence of that in external terms say for example if somebody goes on a smoking binge or a drinking binge may they may use a credit card to to drink but if the credit card is overdrawn they may think i am not paying anything right now but eventually they have to pay for it so there is a external consequence of their action but there is a internal consequence also and the internal consequence is that the inclination to drink becomes stronger and even if they somehow pay off the debt that they have incurred during the drinking binge but still that inclination to drink has not gone in fact it has become stronger mm -hmm. and <clears throat> even if they have the okay if next time i drink again i'll get into trouble so maybe i should not drink now even that is that is good but whether the disposition will change simply by going through the consequence of the actions that is not for sure so the bhagavatam says that if we have to change our heart if the change has to happen it is not just change in terms of actions it is so it is not just in terms of atonement but it is in terms of change of the heart and that requires purification 
that requires the redirection of our power of desiring and that is what happens through bhakti because bhakti connects us with the all attractive supreme krishna and gives us higher joy in that connection and that connection is the ultimate brings about the ultimate purification so atonement has its utility no doubt but it is not uh, it, that utility is not ultimate in terms of transforming the heart now exactly what it will do to the karma that because karma is not literally mathematical we can you if we can sim simply consider it as a bank account yes i took this much debt but i can repay it but karma is also in terms of actions that have real world consequences some of which are not re repairable so exactly to what extent an atonement will free one from a particular karma that is difficult to know okay thank you thank you very yes. much thank you so actually uh i want to just uh, uh, sort of take this to from an individual level to a mass uh, shared karma level so since the world today is grappling with uh, the coronavirus pandemic so how do we see that from a karma perspective because uh, like the the whole uh, topic is being hard hearted so sometimes the human mind is quick to blame a certain community or or people of a certain nationality you know whose acts actually caused it so at one level it it seems uh, insensitive to think like that uh, but uh, yeah i just wanted to know how do we okay. see that from a karma perspective okay so with respect to karma when there are actions which lead to mass consequences so how do we analyze them from a perspective of uh, say pinning responsibility or accounting seeking accountability see actions have consequences at different levels or rather there are different causes mm, which come together for a particular consequence to result say for example if you consider a snowball when a snow when a small snow pebble is formed on the top of a mountain and starts rolling down now maybe 100 snow pebbles start rolling down so out of them maybe 90 don't move 90 just stop along the way they hit some small ridge or something like that and they just break apart but 10 come down now out of that 10 maybe eight of them just they don't become very big but two of them become big and both of them roll down and one of them rolls down on a path maybe where there's a child who is playing on the ground and it just knocks over the child and wounds that child severely so now uh, what caused this we could say okay the child was injured because of the snowball but we could say that the child could have been playing somewhere else the child was playing there did somebody else help the child to play there or did by the parents uh, didn't take the precaution so that they didn't have a proper fencing or was it that the authorities did not create a proper clearing space below next to the mountain by which the snowball would dry out so you know we have to look at which areas are actionable for us and take action now somebody could say if there had been no snow there had been no snowball and the child wouldn't have been injured but well that's not actionable for us the snow has already fallen so generally speaking for us it's important to look to know that actions have uh, whenever any particular major event happens there are many causal factors that come together to cause to make it happen and we have to look at which of those causal factors are actionable and then work accordingly so with respect to the corona crisis is it that say labeling a particular country or a community is uh, is being insensitive or narrow minded it depends now if somebody is doing it simply to evade one's own responsibility you know i didn't do anything wrong they did something wrong then in that case definitely it's uh, it's not very healthy because okay whoever did this right now i am involved over here and I, it's my responsibility to see how i best i can deal with it so there is uh, when one is accepting one's own responsibility uh, in the state of affairs and is trying to fix them but then i also have to see what else has caused this so if if say a particular country say was negligent in informing others or they neglecting in handling some things 
then that also has to be acknowledged now in terms of karma if you want to go into this it's it's whenever any situation comes upon us it's an unpredictable combination of present and past karma that that causes that situation to come in an unpredictable combination of present and past karma so you could say with respect to the child the child was knocked down by that snowball now we could say the child was playing there that's why the child got knocked down if the child had been playing somewhere else he would not have been knocked down isn't it so that is their action let me say what if the child may get a fractured arm or something like that so is it really fair that the child lost a arm because of something as trivial as as just choosing where to play well yes it's a, it's it's it could be that the present action might be just 1% contributing to it and the past karma might be contributing 99% to it so but you, know, you can't hold at this point the child responsible for the past karma so maybe next time the children parents have to make sure that the there is a fence around the children don't play over there in that particular area if it is a danger zone or the government has to create some kind of say if it's a area where snow regularly falls and snowballs come so then the government has to create some safety measures so the idea is we have to focus on whatever is actionable in our understanding and ultimately the law of karma is also forward looking so whoever has done something wrong say if a particular nation or a particular community has been irresponsible because of which the pandemic has spread rapidly then they will be held accountable ultimately by the law of karma they will also have to bear the consequences for that at our case we should focus on what is actionable for us and not get into the mode of just uh, avoiding our own responsibility and pinning the blame on someone else so the essence for for resolving any such complicated issues about karma one essential principle is okay as a, karma essentially means to take responsibility for our actions so if we do that then how to apply the philosophy of karma will become clearer for us yes, let me take responsibility for my actions and what as while taking responsibility one aspect is also i use my intelligence responsibly to understand what aspects are actionable for me and then i act accordingly we see that krishna and arjuna uh, uh, arjuna he heard about he heard the bhagavad gita and after hearing the bhagavad gita he fought a war that's what happens in the kurukshetra but now after krishna departs arjuna is devastated and then the bhagavatam says arjuna remembers krishna's message of the bhagavad gita and then he becomes calm but after remembering the message of the bhagavad gita in the bhagavatam what does krishna arjuna do arjuna renounces the world and goes to the himalayas the same message but hearing it at two different times two different results why because what was actionable for him there in the kurukshetra war krishna had a mission to establish dharma and krishna wanted to do a particular thing so he did that but when krishna had departed from the world he understood that the our 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 contribution to humanity is like a relay race you know a relay race runner runs up to a particular point and then hands the torch over to someone else so he understood that now that krishna has departed now it's time for me to hand the torch over to someone else so they he handed it over to they handed it over the to parikshit who was enthroned as the next king and they moved on so so we are, if we focus on what is my dharma right now what is my responsibility right now then things will become clearer okay thank you thank you bro thank you so much i actually had a, a question also related to uh, kind of mass karma um as as uh, someone who's trying to practice spirituality um a key principle for example is uh practicing ahimsa nonviolence and so um when for example myself i might not be eating meat um or eggs or fish but living in a country or land where there are mass slaughter of um animals for example for sense gratification um my understanding is that there is some sort of shared karma from just living in on the same land where uh such things are happening is that true and um if so then how does one negate this kind of indirect bad karma or this mass shared karma thank you okay so 
just by living, living in a culture where there are people who are eating meat, even if we don't eat meat, do we get some karma? Okay. There are two distinct understandings of this. So let me start with first my understanding and I'll, I'll talk about alternative understanding and I'll see how that can be reconciled. See, firstly, karma is logical and karma is causal. You know? Karma is basically logical explanation for cause effect correlation. So karma is not like a, a mysterious contagious disease that just spreads to everyone around that person. Hmm? So it's, it's, if person A does something wrong, is it that 100 people around that A will get infected by that karma? Well, karma is not like an infectious disease. It, it's not like a, now the coronavirus normally it spreads to physical contact or through some, some touching a metallic object or whatever. Now is it that karma spreads in some way that we don't even know and we can't do anything about it? It's not like that. The essential principle of karma is that it is we are all accountable for our actions. Our actions will have consequences. That is a, so karma is logical. It's not diabolical. That's the first point. Now, having said that, we can look at the other perspective that there is something called as guilt by association. Guilt by association means, say for example, in Minneapolis now, there's one police person who brutally uh, killed uh, or caused the death of a um, of a helpless person. Now that person did some actions. Now there are other police who were there watching and they didn't do anything. So now they didn't do anything, but they're not doing anything also makes them culpable. So that's guilt by association. Now, but does it mean that uh, does it mean that say, now there are some onlookers who are watching? They took some video camera and they took, took some photos. So now they're telling the police, get off him. You know, he can't breathe, get off him. Now, are they culpable? Should they have gone and tried to physically intervene and push the police person away? Well, well, you know, that is not their role. But now when the riots erupt, everything is being destroyed over there. So it's as if the whole civilization is guilty and we will just destroy the whole civilization. So who all are guilty by association? So is it that the whole city, the whole city administration, anybody who has got any big building or big business, anybody has got a good, a good looking car, expensive car or whatever, is everybody guilty by association? So we understand that here people's anger is blinding them, isn't it? So is the principle of guilt by association true? Yes, but it has a limited ambit to it. It's not that everybody in a particular city or a particular country is to be blamed for one person's actions, especially if everybody else is condemning those actions. If some people are condoning the actions, if some people are praising those actions, then it becomes different. But when there's universal condemnation for a particular action, then you can't blame everyone for it. So similarly, the point is that there is some level of culpability, like the Mahabharat says that we may say, I eat meat, but I don't kill the animal. Well, but if you were not eating meat, the, the whoever is killing the animal would lose in incent incentive for killing me, cut killing that animal. He says, no, but there are millions of people. If I don't eat, somebody will else eat. But that's what everybody thinks like that, isn't it? Everybody in their own small way contributes. So if somebody is a part of the meat eating business, meat eating industry, not just they eat it, but they cook it, they serve it, then they are all in a sense co-conspirators. So there is a concept of guild by association, but it's not that that guild by association doesn't have an infinite limit to it. Say if we are having friends or family members or relatives who are who eat meat. If we start thinking just by associating with them, I will start getting contaminated. Then we may become too judgmental. And it's more important that we maintain a human connection and avoid judgmentality. So yes, of course, we would prefer, we would ourselves choose not to eat food with meat. 
we may also have certain higher standards where we don't eat a particular kind of food or whatever or food cooked in a particular setting that is up to individual standards but the point is guilt by association is not like a mysterious contagious disease that spreads everywhere now <clears throat> again to take another example for this point let's say we <clears throat> live in an environment where the air is polluted the water is polluted and we breathe from that we breathe that air or we drink that water and we fall sick because of that so who is responsible for this so is it the industries which polluted the atmosphere is it the government which did not which allowed those industries to come up or is it the is it we ourselves who did not take adequate precautions because of which we got infected maybe we were meant to uh, wear a mask or do some regular exercises for cleansing our breath or whatever so you know again go back to the point of responsible what is actionable for us if it is our calling or inspiration to be like environmental activists then we can go in that direction and do particular things but if that is not our particular calling then we can focus on just doing things to protect ourselves and especially if we try to serve krishna and practice bhakti then whatever incidental karmic infections might come up krishna will take care of those but definitely we need to be conscious and try to avoid our involvement at least directly in anything which is involving karmic culpability but we don't have to live in a constant paranoia or constant pessimism that i can never be pure i can i'm always going to get contaminated we don't need that kind of pessimism or paranoia okay thank you thank you hi krishna prabhu so going back to um mass karma you know that we talked you talked about before yeah. could you give us more of a thorough explanation of mass karma you know how different jivas we are all different jivas coming from different histories and how you know in one event all of our karma can be satisfied like say for instance in a plane yeah. crash or something like that yeah it's complicated mass karma is really quite difficult to understand but so as i said some math mathematical ex example can convey karmic truth to some extent although it's not a exhaustive or necessarily a precise explanation to so say everybody comes in this life with a particular karmic balance bank balance some positive some negative and when they come with that karmic balance then as they go through their life they incur some karma they exhaust some karma both again positive and negative and that is what they are all carrying with them so suppose some suppose there are 100 people in a plane and that plane crashes they and say all there are no there's no survivors over there all 100 unfortunately die so now it's tragic at one level and as far as the government is concerned the aircraft manufacturers are concerned their traffic air traffic controllers are concerned they have to look from their perspective what was our dharma did we do anything wrong hmm? say if the plane is crashing then if the if the air pilot can if you try as much as possible if the plane has lost control at least don't let it crash into a civilian area maybe let it crash into some ground where there's no people so at least there are no further casualties so at all times we have to consider our dharma so that we can minimize the minimize the pain that is in the pain or the distress that is inevitable hmm? uh, having said that so from this life's perspective all the people will have different karmas Uh, uh, say for example now with respect to the pandemic we might say that this is one cause of this is the wet markets in wuhan because of the indiscriminate slaughter of animals and especially in that context that's where the zoonosis happened and the germs uh, the virus got came into human beings so yes that, that could be true but having said that now we may say even people who don't eat meat are also dying because of this so when a pandemic is happening if we say this is caused by meat eating but then why about people who are not eating meat are also dying about it so what we understand over here is that say 
if a person has a person dies and the death exhausts thousand units of negative karma again the mathematical examples are not precise but is as indicative say death exhausts thousand units of negative karma hmm. now some people can have a prolonged and painful death hmm, which might exhaust not 10 not 1000 but 10000 units of past karma because for days and weeks and months they suffer before years they suffer sometimes okay but somebody dies in a sudden say plane crash so then now how those peoples or which of those the, the thousand units of karma that will be exhausted by their death now when they accrued those thousand units can vary it could be from a previous life it could be from this life it could be just at that time itself sometimes we do see karmic justice occurring some semblance of karmic justice occurring at a immediate level in the sense that say somebody tries to set fire hmm, to a particular house or to a particular establishment and somehow they slip into the fire and they die so we could say in a simplified level they try to kill someone but they got killed so it is basically they got the consequence for their action now again whether this is exactly precise karma as a karma cannot be reduced to math precise mathematical or simple one to one uh, action reaction correlation because it's subtle it involves free will it involves one's past actions reactions but the principle is that everybody who dies say in a in a in a tragic event like a plane crash uh, they had accrued certain amount of negative karma and that got exhausted at that time so they may not have done anything at all to accrue that karma in the immediate past so if that has happened then in that case we say they are innocent and if it is possible for us to save them we should try to save them but um, it is that mass karma involves uh, the the simultaneous exhaustion of a certain large quantum of karma for all the people who are, are victimized by that event but when they have incurred incur that karma will be at different times in the past that makes sense thank you thank you <laughs> yeah um brody just a uh, small questions uh, so so how do we assess that uh, you know we are becoming cold hearted uh, maybe like as you mentioned inactivity could be uh, one one way or blame could be another so how exactly can you can you shed light on how do we understand whether we are becoming cold hearted okay so anger indicates that something is wrong but anger doesn't always indicate what is wrong just like say now uh, when there are this uh, there was this victimization of a of a non resisting per per person by the police now when we see that video we feel we feel shocked we feel disgusted we feel angry Now, if you don't feel angry on seeing something brutal, something uh, unfair, that indicates that our consciousness has become deadened. So, anger is healthy in the sense that if it indicates something is wrong, but anger doesn't precisely indicate what is wrong. So, what has happened in the sense? What has happened? People, as I said, really just brutally destroying things. So, what has happened? They they are considering this whole country, whole civilization, all wealthy people. They are all bad. so quite often when something bad has happened something unfair something brutal has happened uh, to uh, anger or a sense of outrage it's not bad that indicates oh this should not happen and whenever we hear so 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 one simple exercise could be that whenever we hear about some terrible thing happening somewhere what is our reaction first reaction you might say thank god it didn't happen to me or it might oh my god if it happened to that person tomorrow it may happen to me or it may be that you know this is so horrible what must that person have suffered when they were going through this or what might their family members or loved ones be thinking right now 
so quite often we go through different reactions you could say almost like a it's a fresh or first reaction first fresh emotional reaction what we have and if there are some people who become sadistic they not only feel no pain in causing pain to others but they actually feel joy in causing pain to others so now that is horrible so we can ask us look at when somebody is when we hear about somebody suffering what is our reaction to that do we just try to deaden ourselves to that pain just not don't think about it or if we think about it what do we think about it so we may not be able to do anything to practically deal with some issues also once prabhupad i think was in australia and one lady asked him swami ji can you pray for me it was in america not in australia and prabhupad said yes i am always praying for you if i hadn't been praying for you what reason is there for me to come here across the seven oceans so now prabhupad was not just praying praying is to offer good wishes but prabhupad also offering some good wisdom by which they could all say praying means what you offer good wishes means may good things happen to you that's praying but it can also mean that you know maybe you maybe i can help you to do something good or maybe i can help do something good for you so prabhupad by sharing spiritual wisdom and giving her or giving his audiences options to make better choices resources to make better choices prabhupad was not just passively praying may good things happen to you prabhupad was also actually trying to help them to act in a way to was equipping them to act in a way that which more good things will happen for them so in that sense uh, we may not be able to practically do anything in a particular situation but if you look at our emotions or maybe our instinctive reactions or our first or second reactions to such uh, such uh, painful events and then we see how we could change those so by, by that we can understand whether we are becoming compassionate or hard hearted or what exactly that makes sense yes prabhu thank you thank you any other prabhu, questions yeah and one more question yes, um please. in regard to um you know understanding that everything that we do accrues some sort of karma so how do we stay motivated and and confident in our choices you know with that understanding no oh, why how is motivation related with consequences of our actions means can you really explain the question a little bit yeah so if we're feeling you know maybe some people may start to feel like well you know how do i make choices how do i keep going if if i'm not sure about the karma that i'm going to get from this you know they might feel paralyzed or okay you know not wanting to act uh, that's true you know if we feel my actions every action will have consequence i don't know what to do that might paralyze us yes so life never comes with the guarantee of right choices mm-hmm. we for example from if somebody the doctor also so right now we have the corona pandemic going on and now doctors are trying different treatments some people are saying okay take this medicine or some people are trying to take this there are many many non conventional non allopathic medicines which are coming up people they take this substance eat this drink this so many things are coming up now so uh we don't so even when doctors are trying out different vaccines they may try out six different channels maybe one works and others don't work we don't know in advance what will work and what will not work so with respect to our actions when we have to choose there are three factors to it there's the content of the action there's the intent of the action and there's the consequence of the action so content intent and consequence so when we say a particular decision was wrong on what basis do we decide it was wrong hmm? is it intrinsically it was a wrong choice say if i have if somebody has a option okay should i choose this job or this job or this job i have three options so now how do i decide which a, a particular choice is right or wrong so sometimes you know we use our intelligence and we look at okay how much growth prospect is there how much am i am being paid how close it is to my house or how much of other how demanding it is there are so many factors we may consider mm-hmm. so based on the content we might make a decision 
or we can look but sometimes we might this might seem to be like a particularly very good decision but then somehow like say a six months ago nobody could have predicted that the world would be shut down because of a pandemic so then somebody starts a new business and they have done all the calculations and this is going to work very well it's a promising business but then sometimes because of factors beyond one's control the consequences turn out to be counterproductive so then was it a wrong decision or a right decision so it is a, we might say that because it it led me to a lot of losses so it's a bad decision but at that time it didn't seem to be a bad decision isn't it so we can't really precisely ever know that which action will have what consequence so what we can do more is that there are certain actions that we know which we should do and certain actions which you know we should not do there are there are black and white which we know so we just make sure that we do the black and white actions properly means we do the we avoid the black actions and do the white actions and then whatever falls in between the shades of gray if we strive to do our best krishna will guide us either he will guide us toward the best choice from within the dami buddhi yogam tam yena ma api antite or even if some unfortunate consequences come up unintended consequences krishna will protect us from them and that's how we will be able to move forward okay so <clears throat> that's why we have to also recognize that inaction is also a form of action inaction can also lead to consequences like a doctor has a particular patient and the doctor doesn't can't figure out what exactly is the diagnosis what what is wrong with this patient now the doctor may say till i can figure out what is the diagnosis i can't give any treatment well that's one way of looking at it but if the patient is thinking then what do you do maybe try something to at least save the patient so sometimes inaction can also be itself culpable so that's why we just try to keep a intention of service as much as possible use whatever intelligence we have to determine the content of the action and then move forward if the consequence turns out to be counterproductive then maybe we turn to another course of action so don't worry too much about which is the right and wrong course of action just use a certain level of intelligence as much as we can and do the best that is possible okay thank you thank you hari krishna Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Um yes, if yeah, we yeah, have please. time for one more question, I also had yeah, sure. uh one final question. Relate we just um to Tiffany's question um and your answer um with everything we do we are incurring karma and we get very wrapped up into it and some people make very concerted efforts to try to perhaps change their karma or change the cards that they are dealt. Um my understanding is that for example in asian countries it's very popular to for example uh remove beauty marks or remove freckles on their face and people go to the even the extent of plastic surgery um but i don't understand how that's possible for example if you were to remove some freckles on your cheek that you will become smarter or remove a freckle underneath your nose or beauty mark underneath your nose that you'll make more money how is something so small able to change your karma is that true and it, how is that possible thank you okay <laughs> well is that the removing of freckle or something like that will make one smart or will help one earn more we humans constantly exist at a junction of the known and the unknown of the controllable and the uncontrollable so we know that our actions matter say somebody is going on a ship or on a boat now they know they have to row expertly they have to be skilled but one giant wave can come and destroy everything so there is there is a lot that is unknown which can which can devastate everything that we are working on there is a lot that is uncontrollable so different traditions have come up with different ways of appeasing that unknown of appeasing that uncontrollable now whether those those particular practices work or not that's something which we'll have to see case to case 
because it could be they are associated with something spiritual and then if there's only something spiritual or something higher at a at a celestial cosmic level certain actions might lead to certain consequences so for example <clears throat> it is recommended say in the vedic tradition that somebody can do certain yagyas certain fire sacrifices or certain rituals by which some can which people can ward off certain co- unwanted consequences or can get certain desired results so now exactly how this happens whether it happens now all this we'll have to look at the particular tradition carefully what is the source in the tradition whether it is actually based on based on scripture or it is coming from somewhere else so just because something is traditional doesn't mean it is scriptural the tradition can also have a lot of things which have not come from scripture in fact many superstitions are like that so there could be certain things say for example in the krishna book in the 10th canto it is said that <clears throat> when whenever krishna was uh, uh, krishna's life was endangered by a demon and then it was saved at that time my mother ishoda and all the other coward ladies you know they would maybe move some animal whisker on the body of krishna or chant certain mantras write certain make some symbols on his body so though that was we could say at that time those were the practices that were considered to be required for warding of misfortune now were they scriptural were they traditional we don't know because we see at that time even krishna when the govardhan puja is being performed krishna asked them asked the rajwasis is this a scriptural worship or is this simply a traditional worship that means that everything that is happening even at krishna's time it's not necessarily scriptural so see everything that is described in scripture is not necessarily in the teaching of scripture the govardhan puja is described in krishna leela but that is not a teaching that everybody has to do govardhan puja isn't it so the point i'm making is that there are similar practices that are described even krishna leela so like do something by which maybe future misfortune on the child will not come so uh now with respect to this i'd say that the krishna conscious attitude is pragmatic that means that if we are in a culture where everybody does these things we don't have to go on a campaign to say hey, all this is superstition stop it hmm? there's, okay there's no need to as as there's a saying do in the rome as romans do so that means if there is something which has almost become like a social custom and we are not uh, we are not either emotionally it's it's not directly against devotional principles hmm? it's not against devotional principles and it, and it doesn't any if it doesn't really disturb us too much rationally or emotionally to do it if others are doing it and they insist you do it well doing it is no big deal so we don't have to be campaigners against it we don't have to be campaigners for it unless we don't have to campaigners for it unless there is clear scriptural basis for doing this so there is a there is a room for individuality in the practice of bhakti so certain practices might be some authentic ways of appeasing the unknown but we can't say that for all practices they are true nor can we say that all practices are false so that's why if one has the interest one can actually go into this tradition and look at its rational or scriptural basis or one can just defer to the local situation and do what is required so this is left to the left to the individual okay thank you so, so much thank you. thank you very much for your very thoughtful questions it is wonderful uh, discussing things with all of you hey krishna thank you definitely thank you athena and thank you jitendra hey krishna Thank you, Krishna. Thank you so much. Thank you, Pramaji, <laughs> for your time. Happy to your service. Thank you, Krishna.